This is Kona-san. He's a surfer. He loves reggae. He eats a lot of organic food. He also loves his community. Um, he has a lot of people over at his house all the time. On March 11th of last year, he was at a funeral. His uncle had just died, so his family and him, they all got in a car. They drove up the hill, and they were paying their respects to the uncle. Then the earthquake happened. They all felt the earthquake. What they didn't know was that when they got home, uh, their house was completely gone, along with the rest of the neighborhood that he lived in. They had all been swept away by the tsunami. In his family, they often say, if my uncle hadn't died, we may have all died with if my uncle hadn't died, we may have all died too. Kono-san lives in a town called Motoyoshi. It's um, about 100 miles north of Fukushima, and as you can see, it's shaped like a cove. So there's all these little towns along the coast, and they all form these little communities, these natural communities. But after the earthquake, all these people lost their homes, so they ended up living in temporary housing, and all these communities were completely split up. This house on the left belongs to a fisherman named Koichi-san. And Koichi-san has two kids. You can see his kids' bicycles there, and their names are Misaki and Nagisa. This is Misaki, um, the son. Like everybody else in this town, he loves the ocean, right? These are all ocean people. They surf, they fish, they swim. These kids play in the water all the time. After the earthquake, though, none of them went in the water anymore. They couldn't sell fish from this region. They, there's a ban on surfing all along the coast. So they, and they don't want to go in the water. It's not a happy place anymore. So these kids are really frustrated that they can't go in the water. But the people of Tohoku of northern Japan are actually really well known for being really resilient. And um, they're used to natural disasters. So what happens is they adapt. So these kids who can't go in the water anymore now they're doing stuff like learning how to play piano. This is a piano that was donated to them by one of the volunteers, and she's in her temporary house playing a song. The fishermen from Motoyoshi are actually really famous. It's um, the home to some of the world's best bluefin tuna fishermen. They go around the world all, like, throughout the year, um, leading crews of men from all over the world uh, to fish. And also, Motoyoshi is uh, located in this unique position where the northern current meets the southern currents. There's a lot of really unique fresh seawater, uh, sea life here. But they can't fish anymore. They can't sell the fish from the region, and their whole infrastructure is gone. So what are they doing? So they're adapting, right? So these generations of fishermen are now becoming entrepreneurs. When I went to see them, they had been making hammocks out of fishing nets, and they were selling these by phone order. A lot of the houses that were destroyed have roof tiles that have generations of artisanship and craftsmanship um, built into them. These are like, you know, traditional roof tiles. And if left um, untended, these would have been, become part of the rubble and ended up in the trash. So what happens here is these guys, they're master carpenters from all over the country. They came up here, salvaged these tiles, and they didn't keep them for themselves. They used it to build a beer garden for the community. A beer garden might sound trivial, but it's actually the first new construction in Motoyoshi, and it's also the only place where everybody in the community can get back together and just have fun and not think about all the sadness. Japan has had earthquakes forever, right? I think the first recorded earthquake was in the year 684, and in the late 1880s, geologists from all over the world would come to Japan to study earthquake science. So natural disaster is something that's really frequent, and people are used to it. They you know, go through an earthquake, they go through some loss, they mourn it, they move on, they rebuild. Nuclear disaster, whole other issue. So um, let's hear one of the residents talk about it. People who died because of the tsunami, you know they died because of the tsunami. Or the homes that were gone, you know that, that was a tsunami-related incident. But this kind of damage, um, to be 
blunt, even if they had said in the first couple days, like, we're having a nuclear meltdown, a triple nuclear meltdown, like, nobody could have moved anyway. Like, we didn't have, this is not a regular situation, we didn't have gasoline. There were no trains, there were no buses. What are you gonna do? Is the whole city of Fukushima gonna get on their bicycles? The fears are, the fears are real. The worry that people have in their stomach and the fear about whether you're safe or not or whether decisions you're making for your family are the right ones, those are real, you know? And until someone gives us believable data um, and a ground that you can stand on to make a real decision, people are gonna have this stress in the pit of their stomach forever. That's Autumn. She's an American woman. Uh, about a decade ago, she was traveling around the world. She's one of those people who just travels. And a friend of hers told her, hey, Japan's a great place to go to raise some money so you can keep traveling. So she stopped through Japan. She ended up falling in love with this community of surfers in Sendai, which is um, three hours west of Motoyoshi, and ended up living there. She also met her husband, Yuji, who's a local carpenter. And Autumn set up shop as an herbalist. And so they've been living there. And Motoyoshi was their favorite surf spot. So they would go there on weekends. When the earthquake happened, they drove out to Motoyoshi. And they realized they've been hearing about all this aid money that was being raised all over the world for Japan. But none of it was here. So they got an airplane. They went to the US. And they started telling people about this beautiful community. Um, and how they had nothing there and how they just wanted to raise awareness about what's going on, right? There's this amazing community. They don't have any aid right now. Could really use your help. One of the nonprofits she connected with, with in the U.S. was called Architecture for Humanity. They're here in San Francisco. And they ended up funding a lot of the projects in Motoyoshi, or they ended up getting funding for a lot of the projects in Motoyoshi. That's also how I heard about Autumn. Uh, so last summer, uh, Jason Wishnow is the film director at TED. He and I were in Asia, so we ended up going to visit Autumn. And we spent a couple days just digging through rubble and hanging out with these guys. They just did normal things like play music and eat food. And after we felt comfortable enough with them, we started doing interviews with them. We also gave them cameras so that they could when we were gone, they could shoot their own lives and, and tell their stories in their own way. And every couple months, Autumn would send us a hard drive full of footage. The result of all that is We Are All Radioactive, which is an online, episodic, crowdfunded documentary that we're currently in the process of rolling out. A big emphasis of this movie is community. So it's not just about this community called Motoyoshi, but it's also about how to engage community in making a film and watching a film. So obviously, we have a Facebook page. And um, we have, you know, all our fans are on this Facebook page. But we don't want it to just be a place where you go to watch the movie, right? Like, documentary filmmaking doesn't have to be this one-way stream of communication from audience to subject. The subjects are also people. They're all on Facebook. They want to tell their story to these people. They want to connect with them. So what we're hoping to do through this page is connect them the audience, the subjects, the experts on radiation, um, all these people through pre-existing platforms that work. Uh, sure enough, after we built our Facebook page, we realized, oh, the guys in Motoyoshi have their own Facebook page. And they've been posting pictures of what they're up to. They're farming seaweed because they found out that seaweed is safe from radiation in their area. So they're, again, innovating. And they're, they're happy. <laughs> And um, yeah, so that's really cool. And the other component to our film is that right now it's entirely crowdfunded, which means when we raise a certain amount of money, we then release that episode. So each episode is about four minutes long. And instead of moviegoers going to buy a ticket and then watching the film, it's as if the moviegoers are paying for the production of the film, and then we're releasing it for free to a wider audience. Crowdfunding is proven to work, right? Everybody's heard of Kickstarter. Um, we're using Indiegogo, which is a similar platform. And you know, we think that maybe this is the future of cause-related documentary, is to do it in episodes online and to crowdfund it.
why I'm doing this. Um, I'm doing this because I'm from Japan and a lot of my friends and family still live there. And after the earthquake, I was like, oh, what can I do to help? And because I'm a journalist and a storyteller, I realized that the best thing I could do is to empower these people whose stories aren't being told through story. So, and we still have a lot of stories that we want to tell. Like we have um, future episodes about geeks who are monitoring radiation everywhere all over the country, about guys who don't trust the government anymore, so they want to go in the water themselves to see if their bodies will get deformed. We also want to debunk some myths about radiation, right? There's a lot of information out there, misinterpreted information, misinformation, uh, and sometimes people don't know what to believe. So in episodes four, five, and six, we're going to start to meet experts who study this, who are there, who treated plant workers, and um, they'll start to tell us what's, what, what, how we should really be looking at this and understanding it. Speaking of new episodes, we actually just finished episode three, and I haven't really shown it to anybody yet. We're going to officially release it on Monday, but since it's done, I decided to end this talk by showing it to you guys. Thank you. で、あと車で逃げたんです。それその車で高いところに逃げたっけ。そこまで来たんだでは水。全部行ってみたらもうそこ綺麗にもう流されちゃって。開けたらね。あそこら辺もほら上がったんですよ。もう年取ってきたから今の仕事続けていけたらなと思って力始めましょうっていう感じです。え、all kind of thing happened, you know. There were two things which were bad in my life, and that was a girl and my job. So I cancelled both of them out. Moved out of Tokyo, moved here. Best thing I have done. That was my uh, lifeline. That was my chance. Day to day, I did different work, from like carpentry to laboring to lumberjacking to like building work to you know, cooking the evacuation centers. So we're trying to prioritize in every job we do. The other day, I dug out a well, fresh water spring well, which they were going to use for a week. We're trying to dig another one today. My majority work is, uh, is hard labor, <laughs> I guess. The tip has been helping me for 10 days now. He was on holiday and he used to live in Japan. Then he just quit his journey, probably sitting on the beach drinking pina, pina coladas, margaritas, right? And come in, like, get in the trenches and, and uh, give a hand.十三年こっちで住んでて、みんなこっちの人がね、こう育ててくれたっていうかね。そうそう、その前からやっぱその再利用ってリサイクル、あのこれもなんでこう回収しないといけないかって言ったら、昔の人の知恵とかその手間がす
actually I have this NPO behind me, Architecture for Humanity. And these concerns that you've told me about, I think we can do something about. That's the way we've really ended up being part of the community. You know, That's the way that I feel really comfortable with the projects that we're doing. I feel like they're really something that they need because, yeah, they didn't come from me. They came from them, you know? The structure that they're working on is a beer garden, which sounds trivial, but it's the first new structure in Motoyoshi that's going up. It's the first place in town where people can gather, can drink, can have beers. There's a mobile ramen truck there that a local business owner can operate, and inside the attached building is going to be a fish shop and an udon shop for other local business owners that have lost their shops. waltz into a community after a huge tsunami and be like, okay, let's build a school, you know, because they don't trust that you're going to be able to do something like that. If you ask them for little things, you know, you start by buying chainsaws for people who need them. Then they start to realize, okay, this is someone that can actually do stuff, you know, and then once they trust you with that, then they'll start asking you for bigger things, you know. Every small thing you do sets the stage for you to be able to do something bigger. Yeah, the amount of, like, you know, gratitude we get is just... That's what makes me like, love being here. Uh, the the Yay! 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 Yay!